So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. at home and welcome to another exciting episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Drew and today we're here at Poplar Lick in Grantsville, Maryland. We're going to be using a variety of methods to catch brook trout so we can monitor the population of this native Maryland species. So we're getting ready to do our annual population monitoring on Poplar Lick here today. Hey guys, how's hey. it going? How you doing how's Drew? It going? Good, so what are we doing here? Well we're getting ready, we're going to go in there and sample our native brook trout population here in Poplar Lick. We do it every year. Awesome. So what is your program? Well, Matt and I work for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and we are part of the brook trout program. All we work on is brook trout populations statewide throughout Maryland. So how do you monitor the brook trout population? Well, our main method of monitoring how the brook trout populations are doing is to keep track of how many fish are in the streams, how they're reproducing, how many young fish we have, how big our fish are, uh, and different metrics that we use to monitor the population itself. Why are the fish important? Well. Native brook trout in Maryland are our only trout species that we have that were here forever. They're our, they're our only native species. So it's really important to protect them and make sure they're doing okay. And over the years, as more and more people have come into Maryland, we've lost a lot of our native brook trout population. So we have a lot less brook trout left than we used to have. So we want to be very, very careful that we save what we have left now and, and, and hopefully someday start to get more of them back. So what specifically is affecting the brook trout population? Well, brook trout are kind of like an aquatic canary in the coal mine. Uh, they are very sensitive to changes to the habitat that they live in. So if you get warming water coming off of uh, parking lots or off roofs that's been warmed by the sun and flows into their stream, that can kill them. Uh, they're very sensitive to sediment flowing into the stream. If you build uh, new roads and, and some of the dirt washes in the streams, that's bad for brook trout. So uh, things, that, things that affect the quality of the water affect the, the ability of the brook trout to survive and, and stay in the streams. And as more and more people enter the, the area and the environment, it makes it harder to, to keep the brook trout there. Uh, we are learning uh, how to restore things and how to protect things more and more as we go. But over the years, there's been, been some loss. And you know, we're trying to, to stop that and turn the corner, go back the other way. So how do you get population data? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, every single year, in these areas we come back to the stream and we do the same site over and over and that way we can monitor population trends through time but to start with what we'll do is we'll set up block nets at the very bottom of the site and at the very top of the site and those block nets prevent fish from leaving or coming into it and that way whenever we sample the fish we know we have everything stuck right there they can't get away and we have the opportunity to collect those all the fish that are present uh, and if you have fish come in or fish go out you can bias your numbers either high or low, one way or the other, because they will try to escape. And the, and the method we'll be using today is called electric fishing. So we'll be putting electric current into the water, which will knock the fish out. It won't harm them, but it'll knock them out. We can scoop them up, collect them, we'll hold them, then we can do get the metrics we need, such as length, weight, how many fish are there, and uh, that's how we get our, our actual data. So what is the value of this study? Well, there's a, there's a couple things that are important about the brook trout being here. One is just from a conservation perspective, they're, they're part of our landscape, they're part of what makes Maryland, Maryland. It, it's good to have them here. The other aspect is they're a recreational species. A lot of people like to fish for them and they've been fishing for brook trout for hundreds of years in Maryland. And we wanna make sure that there's brook trout out here for future generations to enjoy and catch. Uh, this area especially, this Upper Savage River watershed is one of the most unique areas for brook trout in the whole mid-Atlantic region. South of Maine and in New England, this is one of the best brook trout fisheries there is. We have a hundred miles of streams that are all still connected. These brook trout can migrate from the main stem up into a trip, back out into the main stem. They can move the way they used to, to move hundreds of years ago before uh, you know their environment started changing. So it's, it's an incredibly unique and, and special resource uh, and that's one of the biggest reasons to make sure uh, they're doing good and we're out here uh, you know keeping tabs on them and protecting them and, and restoring things best we can. Uh, another issue uh, that ties into uh, what affects brook trout is brook trout are sensitive to water temperature. They need cold water. And we have a disease called woolly adelgid disease that kills our hemlock trees, our native hemlock trees. We lose those hemlock trees, 
more sunlight can come in, the water can warm up because of the, the increased heat, and it can affect our brook trout populations too. So there's, there's a lot of different things affecting them. If you look around these woods here, you see little red ribbons on a lot of the hemlock trees. Our forestry people are treating the trees, trying to protect them. They're studying that disease, trying to stop that disease and find a cure for it, which will you know, help protect our brook trout in the long run also. When we come back, we're gonna catch some brook trout. Now it's time for Aqua Quiz with your host, Drew Cruz. I'm your host, Drew Cruz, and now it's time to test your knowledge with another Aqua Quiz. Brook trout, widely esteemed as one of the most beautifully colored of all freshwater fish, have a rich history in Maryland. Before European settlement, brook trout could be found in Maryland streams and rivers. The fish were enmeshed in Native American culture and lore, revered by the Seneca Indians and the Six Nation tribes as a gift from their spirit leader, Manitou. Do you know what fish family the brook trout comes from? Is it A, bass, B, sunfish, C, salmon, or D, perch? I'll have the answer after the break. Aqua Kids will be right back. Wanna keep up with our adventures? Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Welcome back. Do you know what fish family the brook trout belongs to? The answer is C, salmon. The brook trout is Maryland's only native salmonoid. Wow, a salmon salad sandwich would be pretty great right now. <laughs> I'll see you next week with another Aqua Quiz. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. set up our nets, which makes this a closed sample area. What's next? Well, Drew, let's go catch some brook trout. All right. All right, boys, are we ready? We're ready. Yeah, let's do this. Let's catch some fish. Shocker on. OK. There's a the sculpin. There's a brook trout. There's brook trout. Careful. <laughs> Big one. Or, well, not really. There's, one. There's, There's brook trout. trout. There's three of them. Keep dipping. Good job. Got the young of the year. There's the other one. There you go. In there. That's not fun. All right, Drew, you stand right there mm -hmm. and watch for him to come down. There's the sculpin. There. There's See that brook trout? I get him. Oh! Just missed him. Of course I did. It's a good spot for young trout. Yes. There's, There's one. In your net. Good. Two. Yep. There should be some fish up near this log. All right. Oh, there's one. Okay, stay back behind the anode. There you go. Right there. There they are. Oh, I got him. That is a big brook trout. Beautiful fish. All right, let's get her in the bucket. Yep. So you guys do this annually? Yes, we do this uh, 24 stations here in the Savage Watershed every single year. This shallow water is typically where the young trout like to live, the ones that were born just this spring. And yeah. that's why we <laughs> want to make sure we sample all this habitat. Mm -hmm. Now the fish will come up to the anode ring typically, so you don't have to chase them down deep too often. There's the brook trout. There's a good one. Go ahead and scoop. Nice. Well done. Oh. Got him. Good job. That's a beast. All right, I got two ones. Here. Another nice fish here. Okay, let's finish this pool off. Right here, Drew. Big fish coming. Getting that time? Yep. Got him. Well good. done. Good. There's a big wow, brook trout. Look at that. Holy cow. That is a big. big. All right, Drew, we're done with our sample. We caught a lot of fish. Now it's time to go get some data off them and length and weight. All right. We'll be right back. Hi, Drew here. You know, it excites me to meet kids like us who love to protect the earth as much as we do. Young people who are pioneering powerful ways to conserve and protect our planet. I call them eco defenders. Let's find out what they're doing.
I decided a few years ago that I was going to make climate change my life's work because it is the largest issue that my generation is facing. Much of the reason is because of our current political and economic system, a system that prioritizes economics over our environment and our climate. But fortunately, addressing climate change and growing economically are not mutually exclusive. They can work together, but we need to value humans just as much, if not more, than economic growth for us to properly address the issue of climate change. There are lots of different angles and tools that people can use to tackle the issue of climate change. I'm currently focusing on divestment because I think it's the best way that I can leverage my power as a student. I first joined the divestment campaign on NAU when I started my first year in forestry graduate school. I am currently working with Fossil Free NAU and we are working to get our university to divest from the top 200 coal, oil and natural gas corporations. For our movements to succeed, we must master the art of creating leadership. What I want for our campaign is to create as many leaders as possible that can create other leaders, that can create other leaders, that can create other leaders. I also hope that the work people do here will not end here and that they will take the skills that they have learned on this campaign to other parts of their life and beyond this community. The fossil fuel divestment movement has grown faster than any other divestment movement that has existed. What we're doing is changing the political landscape. Wasn't that great? Now it's your turn. If you or someone you know is doing something remarkable to help our planet, let us know about it. You could be our next Eco Defender. See you soon. Aqua Kids will be right back. Hi, Drew here. For more information on today's show, go to aquakids.tv. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Polar bears are the largest land carnivore on Earth and live almost exclusively on sea ice that forms along the Arctic coast in places such as Alaska, Canada, and Russia. With a heavy pelt, thick layer of blubber, and fur on the bottom of their feet, these aggressive predators are designed for the cold. Polar bear prey on a variety of different animals, including beluga whale and walrus. However, seal is their primary food source. Remains left from a polar bear meal sustain a host of Arctic scavengers. There are only about 25,000 polar bears left in the wild. Global warming has stunted the development of sea ice, making it nearly impossible for this animal to hunt and thrive. Sadly, at their current rate of decline, these fantastic creatures could be extinct within three decades. Find out ways you can help the polar bear and other apex predators on our website. Welcome back. We're back on the bank and we're ready to measure these fish. Show us how it's done. We're gonna bring the fish over. We're gonna put them in this bucket. It's got fish anesthetic in it. Knock them out, calm them down so we can get our lengths and our weights without harming the fish. Then we'll put them back in a recovery bucket, and when we're done, we'll let the fish go back into the stream where they came from. Awesome, let's do it. All right, Garrett, go ahead and dump. Watch out there, Ocean. Right in the net. Yeah, don't lose them. Okay, now just dump the rest of them. Now this has to go quickly. Okay, you ready? Okay. Now, grab the, there you go. Just pick it straight up and dump them right in. Now, everybody hanging on. Now it'll take it about a minute or so and those fish will start to turn over on their side. All right, O'Shane, can you grab me a fish to get started here? Yeah. Lay it right there on the measuring board. Okay. Can you tell me how long it is? We'll call that one 243. And then we check for hooking injuries on the jaw. And that's in millimeters, right? Yes, gotcha. that's in millimeters. And the weight is, go ahead and say it out loud. 135. 134.5. 134.5. And then in the recovery. Okay, now we need to go at a quicker pace here. So, 163. 46.5. 79. And these are young years, so we don't take weight on these guys. That's one that was born this spring. All right, we're going to go ahead and put the rest of the fish from the first pass into the anesthetic and get the lengths and weights on, off of, on all of those. 
So from the fish that we've collected in this sample, can you infer how many fish there are in the whole creek? We can get a rough idea from the fish that we collected in this sample. We, uh, we sample representative habitat so that we get both shallow water that has smaller fish as well as bigger pools that may have some of the bigger fish. So we can generally use this to extrapolate out a little bit. Uh, you just have to be careful at times because not all habitat is the same. So with some of the really nice pools that we have in this run, it may, it may make our, our estimates a little bit on the high side, but it's generally fairly representative. Great. And how many spots do you have to uh, collect data? We have in the Savage River watershed each year we do 24 stations on eight different tributaries in the main stem river. That's pretty accurate. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty comprehensive survey. And we got some big ones in there. Yeah, one of the things that makes this place so special, this whole system special, is that we grow really big brook trout in here. For an angler, catching an 8 inch fish or bigger fish is, is really special, but catching a fish that's 10 inches or bigger, that's a trophy fish. Could be a fish of a lifetime for somebody catching native brook trout. Looks like we got some trophy fish in here. Yeah, there's some in here I think can be close to 12 inches. Wow. We've caught some at times up to 14 inches. Oh my lord. Some of the best fish in south of Maine for brook trout are right here in the upper Savage River watershed in western Maryland. Okay, we're ready. Let's do this. Oof. Oh, got the big one first, eh? Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's a beast. 271. One ninety-five point five. That's a beautiful brook trout. Two thirty-two. Hooking injury. See how the mandibles healed a little funny. Mm -hmm. That's a hooking injury from where it was caught and released and had a little bit of damage. One eighteen. You actually multiply it by ten. That'd be two fifty-four. 254 is exactly 10 inches. There's a trophy. Aqua Kids will be right back. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. As you can tell, I'm from Hawaii, and this is my beach report. Today we're here at Shark's Cove North Shore in the island of Oahu of Hawaii. They call it Shark's Cove because one day a shark bit off the legs of a woman that caught too much squid and was permitted. Another name for Shark's Cove is Kulalua. Shark's Cove is a wonderful place to swim, lots of divers, and it's very beautiful. Watch out, because in the winter, sometimes it gets too rough and big waves come, like my friend one time got washed away. But it's okay, he's safe now. Today, if we're lucky enough, we might find some honus or turtles. It will be so awesome and beautiful. There's also a lot of varieties of fish here, such as the humu humu nuku nuku apu ah! <laughs> That's my favorite fish. It's the trigger fish, one of the many varieties of trigger fish. If you can see behind me, over there in that little cove, we're gonna enter and we're gonna make it all around to over here. Let's see what kind of marine life and animals we can find. Make sure you're an Amakuo Okikai, protector of the ocean. If you see opala or trash on the ground, pick it up because it may go into the ocean and hurt our marine life. This is my beach report. See you next time. Well, that wraps up yet another awesome episode of Aqua Kids. Well, the sample we got today was pretty good, but how does it compare to samples in the past? Well, it looked really good today. We saw a lot of fish, a lot of larger fish, uh, the trend over the past few years has been increasing and this continues that trend, so things are looking really good here. This is one of our better brook trout streams in the whole state. This is clearly such a special place. Can people come here to fish? 
Absolutely they can. Uh, most of the watershed here in the Savage River is on public land, so there's a lot of public access for, for folks to come out and fish. All they need is a fishing license. And the key here is they can catch, but they have to release. This is our special management area. All fishing is catch and release. So they'll be here for future generations. Very neat. Well, thank you guys so much for having us out, working with you guys, taking time out of your busy schedules. It's just amazing to see that there's such a bright future for watersheds here in Maryland. Well, we appreciate you guys coming out and working with us. Our pleasure. And we'll see you next time on Aqua Kids. Great working with the Aqua Kids today. Wonderful to see people who share such a, a, a love for the, the resources we have here in Maryland. And you know, it's neat for us as biologists to get a chance to, to be out here and, and see their enthusiasm and, and, and joy in working with these resources.